So hello everyone, welcome to this uh, third session of the Life and Health Seminar Series um, in the CFSA Seminar. Our speaker today is Andrew Barnett, he's a PhD student in K11 and he is um, an expert on uh, organoid ethics. So must be bio. Yes. The focus of Andrew is mostly bioethics, but he has also a scientific background. Uh, and uh, he has already published a couple of papers, <coughs> articles on uh, organoid ethics. And he's going to present a review, an overview of the ethical issues in the field. And I was So, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. I'm very happy to be here. So, thank you all for, for having me and giving me this opportunity to share some of my work. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's really fun for me uh, to, to share um, all this sort of stuff. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I have to give some shout outs to folks, uh, of course, first and foremost to you all for uh, having me here uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, to my consortium, uh, Organovia, uh, Organoids for Virus Research, uh, a, a international training network I'm a part of. Uh, it's the Dutch Society for the Replacement of Animal Testing, um, RIVM uh, in the Netherlands, Marie Curie, and of course the European Commission uh, for helping uh, fund this work. So as I mentioned uh, before, as was mentioned before, I'm presenting uh, a paper uh, that was published uh, a little while ago, just this last year, uh, titled The Many Moral Matters of Organoid Models, and it is a Systematic Review of Reasons. Um, so, I'm going to uh, begin uh, this uh, little chat with you all um, by assuming that you don't really know uh, what an organoid is, I'm sure, uh, because every time I try to explain to folks uh, that I work on ethics of organoids, their first question is, what's an organoid? I have no, I have no idea what, what that is. Um, so an organoid uh, is an organoid. Uh, so it's something, it's a term just means resembling an organ or they are organ-like. And organoids, well there's a many, many, many varieties of organoids. Um, so sometimes in the literature, the scientific literature, instead of seeing organoid, you will see something like cardioid, like cardiac organoid or, you know, something like that. Or, um, <coughs> cerebroid, like a cerebral organoid, or embryoid, an embryo-like thing, right? So there's a bunch of these different kinds of oids, uh, and I'm sort of exploring the morality and the ethics of all of these different kinds of organoids, right? Uh, but organoids are generally defined by a few different things. One um, is first this self-arrangement and self-development characteristic in vitro. So these cells will, if you give them the right kind of medium in a petri dish, they'll naturally uh, uh, sort of evolve or transform themselves into a kind of structure. Usually it's three-dimensional in structure, so it's a kind of spherical uh, entity. And early uh, iterations of organoids were, uh, were first called spheroids for the fact that they would just self-arrange into this three-dimensional sphere-like structure. Uh, and then, of course, the third characteristic of the organoid, generally speaking, is that the organoid has features, and functions, and some structures that are similar to their in vivo organ counterparts. Right? So if I were to try and make a cardiac organoid in a petri dish, you would see a three-dimensional ball of tissue right, that resembles features and functions of a heart. So it would have cardiac tissue made up uh, <coughs> and it would beat in, in a similar fashion uh, in their, uh, as, as a heart would. Um, I should note that organoids are not like miniaturized versions of the organ itself. It's not like someone took a shrink ray to a heart or a brain and just shrunk it down and made like a little mini uh, version of it. Best way I can kind of describe more or less sort of like what an organoid is like is that they're kind of like um, jumbled up versions 
of what you would see in in vivo, right? So if you have something like a car, an organ is like a smaller version of that car, but the car is sort of, the parts are there, it's sort of jumbled up. So like the windows are on the, the floor, the engine is, is in the back, you know, the, the exhaust pipe is sticking out the front. Uh, you might be able to, you know, roll the windows up, you know, up and down, and you might be able to get, you know, there's, there's a radio, but the radio knob is like, you know, over on the side. You might be able to get like a station here or there, you know, and you might maybe be able to turn the engine over. You, you can hear like a, you know, a click click sound, but the engine isn't running, so to speak. So it's kind of like this sort of real jumbled up version of it, but you can still uh, sort of identify these features and functions of the car within this car oid, right? If that makes sense. Uh, yes? What I don't see in the, in the definition, but I guess it's understood, should they be man-made and purposefully man-made? Or well, can they be accidentally man-made or just in nature somewhere? Yeah, generally speaking, um, this is kind of the, the overarching definition that is used in the scientific literature. They don't normally include like the, the man-made part, but they are man-made. You don't see uh, organoids uh, typically in, in nature. The only maybe possible exception to that would be something like a teratoma. But even then, no, no scientist would really call a teratoma an, an organoid. Um, that's kind of the only sort of um, a definition that would be sort of excluded for for something like that, right? If there's any other, yeah. If there's any questions, please feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. Yeah. But to uh, give you some, you know, pretty pretty pictures of uh, what these things look like, just to give you some examples and some more clear ideas of what these uh, things are. What you can see here again, some examples of what organoids uh, sort of look like. You have here uh, in A a brain organoid. So you can kind of see like the folding of the brain here. If you know anything like about uh, brain structure, you can see various uh, cerebral layers uh, forming here. Uh, but it's not, of course, like a complete brain or anything like that. And the folding is not uh, super extreme. Again, I mentioned a bit like the cardiac or uh, 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 this is a liver organoid, so, excuse me. Uh, this is a liver organoid, so it's, uh, again, spherical, it has pieces of liver tissue there, and then the uh, number C, or letter C over there, is a human airway organoid, so it's kind of like a lung organoid, uh, so to speak, or like an esophageal uh, organoid, right? Some more pretty, pretty pictures of uh, what they can look like. This is uh, a typical render of a, uh, of a brain organoid. It's, again, spherical, ball-like uh, structure. Um, this is also a rather famous uh, uh, image of a brain organoid from Madeline Lancaster, sort of the, uh, the godmother of brain organoids, uh, so to speak. Uh, so again, you can see how it sort of looks like a brain, but if you know anything about um, neuroscience and brain biology, uh, you can see, you know, some elements of the brain there, but this just doesn't look quite right in terms of what they're supposed to look like. Uh, sometimes you get some interesting uh, little organoids, like this is another uh, image of a brain organoid, uh, but you can see these uh, two spheres uh, alongside sort of fuse in with the overarching brain organoid itself. Those black spheres are eyes. They are proto-eyes that just sometimes will naturally form uh, when you grow a brain organoid uh, in a dish. And yes, sometimes they will work. Sometimes they will send uh, uh, signals to the brain itself, right? So whenever I show this image to people, sometimes they immediately begin to think, oh, so this is getting some like environmental inputs um, and this is like, looks like, uh, you know, brain, does this thing think? Well, some possible uh, areas of ethical exploration, right? But why would you want to, uh, rather, <coughs> like I said, this is a, a little uh, a snapshot of all the different kinds of organoids that you can sort of make. Again, it's not a complete list, but you can make pretty much any kind of organoid these days, right? You can make a brain organoid, a pituitary organoid, you can make cardiac organoid, lung organoid, pancreas, gut, uh, bone. I've seen researchers grow teeth organoids. Uh, 
organoids. Uh, you can make skin organoids, tumor organoids, or rather tumor relates. Uh, you can make gonad organoids, all different kinds, right? So there's all different kinds and they're used for all different kinds of research. Sometimes you can fuse organoids. You can fuse them all together. You can take a brain organoid with a spinal cord organoid and a muscle organoid and fuse them together to make something called an assembly and make this kind of uh, uh, entity. I, I, I say all these different oids, right? There's so many of these different oids that they're, it's, it, it gets jumbled up sometimes. Um, but it, this is uh, experimental uh, stuff that you, that's uh, sort of coming out more and more now. Uh, this says in the future, but it's sort of uh, present day. So why would uh, researchers do this? Why would they make these little jumbled up pieces of tissue? Uh, why would they make uh, an organ? Well, they do it for a bunch of different kinds of reasons, um, including but not limited to uh, regenerative medicine uh, research, <coughs> toxicology research, drug discovery research, host microbe interactions, um, gene editing research, omics studies, phylogenetic studies, developmental modeling, disease modeling. In fact, uh, some of the research that was used to help uh, develop the COVID-19 vaccine was, uh, uh, utilized organoids, uh, specifically human airway organoids, to try and see uh, the mechanisms of infection uh, for uh, uh, for COVID. Um, we also uh, argue that they are nice alternatives to animal models. In fact, an organoid, in a way, has better representation, even if it's perfect. It is somewhat of a better representative model of what's happening in the human body than an animal model, for instance, right? So they're, they're considered as a, this kind of alternative to animal models and perhaps as a way of better practicing medicine, right? Um, if we're talking about uh, using organoids for uh, precision medicine or for personalized medicine, uh, researchers can take, say, your skin cell, uh, turn it back into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then turn those stem cells into a brain organoid that represents elements and features of your brain and do a whole variety of tests surrounding that brain organoid, and then based on those results, they could figure out a, an appropriate treatment for you. We see this in cancer research, where uh, researchers will take tumoroids, well, they'll take a piece of tumor tissue, uh, and they'll grow a bunch of these different tumoroids, hit them with different doses of chemo, and then based on the results, they will fine tune the dosage and the timing of the chemotherapy to that particular cancer patient. So it's used in precision medicine purposes. Um, we have living biobanks now, where uh, all of these sort of banks of these living tissues can be used for all different kinds of research and creating giant data sets uh, for all different kinds of basic research or of uh, innovative research. Um, developmental modeling, we can do a lot more for making an embryo-like entity, for instance. We can do a lot more studies uh, in embryo development than we could uh, previously with just regular <coughs> embryos, right? Because we're limited in how far we can allow an embryo to develop, right? With an embryoid, the limitation may or may not apply the same way, right? Because it's a non-viable entity. And we go on and on and on, with like transplantation and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of contexts and a lot of different things that you can do with these organoids. In a way, they're sort of method, or, or uh, both um, uh, model and medicine. So, let me get into a little bit just quickly of the methods of this review, right? Because what I wanted to do was sort of explore what are all of these different ethical issues associated with organoid models in research and medicine, right? So. Here I performed a, uh, a systematic review of reasons, so going through all the ethics literature on organoids to see what reasons actually occur in the literature, what arguments occur in the literature, um, and then sort of try and do a bit of thematic analysis of these reasons, right? First pulling out uh, very sort of narrow basic reasons from the literature and then categorizing them into broader reasons and then further categorizing them in, into topics and then into themes, right? So I have my little search string here looking for organoids, ethics, 
uh, and trying to cover my basis in terms of which databases I'm hunting through. So I'm hunting through, of course, uh, the classic Google Scholar, uh, looking through uh, JSTOR, more humanities papers, field papers, and then of course PubMed and Web of Science, right? Because sometimes science publications will, or science journals will publish uh, ethics papers relating to something scientific there, right? Um, and based on uh, <coughs> my, in, uh, my inclusion criteria, we found about uh, 23 papers, including snowballing and looking through references. So this was sort of my first attempt. Oh, this is really hard to read, sorry. Um, so this was sort of my first attempt at this uh, systematic review. And basically, uh, when reading through these papers, I pulled out uh, and coded uh, nearly line by line or a few sentences at a time these particular, re uh, particular reasons, unique reasons within the literature and identifying them as either uh, a positive reason or a neutral descriptive reason or a negative reason or a reason uh, against a particular position. Um, then you have, uh, of course, things like call to action, like more research is needed or uh, uh, we need to uh, do more ethical research in this area. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, what were your inclusion criteria? Like which papers? Which papers? Right. So they had to be published um, and peer reviewed. Uh, they had to be in English, uh, mostly just because I am not a Dutch or French speaker or anything like that. I can, uh, I, I'm only, I only speak English. Um, and basically, they had to be published uh, within, uh, from basically uh, uh, at least 2020. Uh, and, and back to around the first time an organoid uh, uh, came onto the scene, which is around uh, 2010 or so, right? So we're, we were looking for papers uh, in, in that category. So we also had some exclusion criteria, including things like gray literature. Um, so we, we excluded uh, uh, any kind of um, national guidelines, for instance, or any kind of regulatory policies um, and things like that. So we were just really sort of focused on um, ethics papers. And also part of the, uh, the, the criteria is that the, uh, the paper itself or the publication itself had to be primarily focusing on uh, ethical issues relating to organoids. Um, it couldn't just be sort of like a paragraph at the end of, uh, of a paper uh, that says, uh, we need to think about ethics, eth ethical issues like this, that, and the other. Uh, so we had, to, we had to sort of pull that, pull those, uh, uh, put those aside. So that's basically the, the inclusion criteria here. Um, and so basically, uh, the way this, this kind of function is we, uh, as I, as we go through these, um, these papers, pull out the different <coughs> reasons, and then categorize, basically summarize these reasons into the narrow reason uh, category. And then from there, we sort of inductively uh, group them uh, into bigger uh, groups and, and groups that sort of make sense going up. So here you can kind of see it um, in play with the narrow reasons uh, here, and then the broad reasons uh, seeing like, say, uh, we have a reduced refined replacement as a broad reason for uh, these narrow reasons, which and all of these reasons are grouped within the topic of animal models, and all of this topic of animal models is grouped within the broader theme of uh, uh, animal experimentation, right? So we go through this for all 23 of these papers and try and pull out all these reasons and categorize them in various ways. Um, and so here is the kind of end result of it all, right? We ended up with five broad themes, generally speaking, for organoid ethics issues. Um, we have animal experimentation, of course. We have uh, commercialization and consent grouped together. And I'll explain why those two are grouped together. It's because it doesn't seem so obvious like why they are. Um, research and ethics and research integrity uh, as one. Uh, clinical applications and experiments, and organoid ontology and organoid moral status. Um, some of these have slightly, uh, uh, are, are somewhat divided into sort of subtopics or sub-themes rather, like uh, research ethics and research integrity is subdivided into research ethics and 
research integrity, right? Because they're, they're slightly different things. Um, same thing with some stuff like with moral status. Um, there's a sort of, uh, with organoid ontology and moral status, there's a sort of special category of moral status uh, within there. Um, because it just it seemed to make sense to make some slight um, divisions here. Um, and of course, then these, uh, these topics come into play, uh, and these topics, of course, go into uh, the, the broad reasons and the narrow reasons further on, right? So this is a kind of uh, simplified tree of all these different ethic, uh, uh, of ethical issues um, and ethical reasons that are found within uh, organoid ethics. Um, this is a much more complicated version of it. Um, this is something that was plastered on my wall uh, at work, and I would be like drawing lines everywhere and, and, and having like red string all over the places. Uh, my colleagues uh, lovingly referred to this as my conspiracy theory. Uh, so I, I would be, you know, on the wall and just basically saying like, these these are connected in this way, and I'm like, but these are also similar. It's, it drove me mad for. So, let me go on a, a little bit about um, the theme of animal experimentation uh, first, right? Um, I didn't include like the number of reasons uh, uh, in this presentation specifically, but basically animal experimentation was one of the smaller categories that didn't have as many uh, reason mentions um, as the other categories. So uh, one of the topics uh, within the theme of animal experimentation was, of course, animal models. And a question that you can think about here for something like this is, what should happen with lab animals given new organoid research, right? I mentioned before that organoids are sometimes uh, presented as this sort of animal model alternative, right? As a way of doing research without so many uh, animals. So, uh, the, the, I, there are some reasons that you can see here. I have some reasons uh, up below this. Maybe it's a little bit hard to read if you're in the back. Um, but here we have, uh, say, animal use is permitted. So some uh, folks will say, well, while organoids are nice, they're not necessarily so you know perfect as an alternative. So animal use is permitted still. Um, some will argue that you know, <coughs> organoids are actually a pretty decent model and we should move towards more a kind of comply or explain model, right? Where the, you have to comply by using organoids first uh, within your research. And if you can't use organoids in your research for some reason or another, you have to explain why you need to use animal models, right? So this is a, a reason that, that sometimes pops up within the literature here. Uh, we have uh, this idea that with organoids um, should come uh, increase uh, in, uh, uh, in animal ethics standards for journals. Um, some think that uh, journals themselves have a responsibility towards animal welfare and should demand uh, higher standards of ethics in animal welfare given that organoids are perhaps a viable alternative uh, for a bunch of different kinds of research. Uh, we have, of course, uh, lower animal interests, meaning that now uh, with organoids, maybe we can start to consider <coughs> the interests of animals that are, say, non-mammalian. Uh, maybe we need to start thinking of more heavily about the interests of, say, lizard species or snakes or um, fish species and so on and so forth, right? Um, and then, of course, there is the classic paradigm that still pops up of uh, the reduce, refine, replace. Um, and the idea here is that oftentimes uh, researchers will say uh, organoids are a great way to, in a way, re uh, reduce the number of animals that are needed for research um, and to uh, demand more refinement uh, within animal experiments. But most think that it's not going to totally replace uh, uh, animal research uh, altogether, although uh, various organizations will argue that, um, and, and various uh, ethicists might argue that, yes, this can be a, uh, a replacement, uh, perhaps one of many. But then we move on to chimeras, right? I, in a way, organoids are a bit strange in, some, in how they're presented somewhat uh, in this space, because organoids are often presented as this uh, possible viable alternative to animal models, 
And yet, researchers are now, uh, and have been for some time, transplanting organoids into animal models, right, for research purposes. So, for instance, in, this, in the case of chimeras, uh, there's, uh, in the case of here, cerebral chimeras, researchers are transplanting human brain organoids into the brains of animal models, rats, macaques, no study I know of uh, looks at uh, hi even higher order uh, non-human primates than macaques. So no chimpanzees, no gorillas, as far as I am aware, though they are um, heavily protected still. So given this, there's this question that often sort of comes up is, should cerebral chimeras be created with human brain organs, right? Because one of the concerns here might be, say, like humanizing the chimera, right? And, but then there's this sort of question of what does humanizing an animal really mean or really entail, right? Um, then there's, of course, this question of a need for measuring consciousness, right? Because if we're thinking of humanizing, often we're sort of thinking about it in a kind of cognitive capacity context. And so if we're talking about this in a kind of cognitive capacity context or consciousness context, we need some kind of way of measuring consciousness and higher order forms of consciousness if we are advancing or um, generating higher forms of consciousness or possible higher forms of consciousness within the animal model itself. Um, so, but there's also this question of how do we assess, uh, ethically assess, um, cerebral chimeras? That's also a bit of a question here too. Um, but maybe this is also a bit of a continued discussion of prior debate. Maxence and I were talking a little bit before this and saying like, well, <clears throat> you know, researchers have been transplanting stem cells uh, into animal model brains for some time now, right? Um, isn't this in a way just sort of a continuation of what's been going on before organoids have, uh, have come on the scene? Yeah, possibly. Um, then of course there's this question of how do we actually treat cerebral uh, chimeras? Do we uh, have to give them special considerations uh, as opposed to other uh, kinds of uh, animal welfare considerations? Um, there's also questions about important transplant variables, questions about policy guidance, how, how do you create effective policy surrounding this? Um, what are the actual scientific benefits from creating uh, cerebral models? Are, are, the, are these benefits, like say, actual benefits that can be implemented? And, and it's, it's kind of murky, I think. The science is a little bit murky in terms of the direct translatability of some of this chimeric research to human beings, right? It's not exactly clear. And in a way, it might be similar to, say, other forms of animal model research in the, mur in the murkiness of its translatability into <coughs> clinic, right? And then, of course, you know, more special considerations for chimera models. But the, what I've been talking about here has been primarily about cerebral chimeras, right? Because there are other kinds of chimeras than just cerebral chimeras. So researchers will sometimes uh, transplant other kinds of organoids into animal models to, again, look at, like, say, transplantation techniques and so on and so forth. Um, so for general chimeras, when we're talking about what is what I'm sort of defining here as, say, uh, transplanting a liver organoid into, uh, a human liver organoid into a mouse or uh, a macaque or something like that. Um, there's questions still about, say, chimeric research design uh, and whether or not this research design is ethically appropriate, right? Um, and that chimeric research is still sensitive, generally speaking, right? It's not something that is, um, uh, that isn't ethically neutral if it's not cerebral chimeric research, right? Um, there's, of course, concerns about chimeric reproduction. If we're talking about transplanting, say, human gonad organoids into uh, animal models, right? So there's some possible, uh, maybe some possible concerns there, even if scientists say, what are you talking about? It's not really going to affect anything, right? Um, there's uh, concerns over uh, chimera organoid transplantation. Again, another question about humanizing chimeras here um, as well, right? Because if we're thinking about humanizing chimeras, maybe humanizing doesn't necessarily mean uh, just something cerebral. Maybe there's also other kinds of biological components that are related 
to humanizing an animal, right? Um, of course, policy guidance, and then there's this um, tricky question of unknown outcomes for uh, thinking about chimeric research in general. Uh, so these are, this is sort of what has been found in the animal experimentation uh, space of organoid ethics thus far. Are there any, what questions do you have for me about this so far? It seems kind of clear, I guess, right? Yeah. I tried my best to also uh, add something uh, to this space in my, uh, in my other work outside of this review, where even if we're looking at two different kinds of, say, human cerebral organoid transplantation into animal models and looking at two different kinds of experiments, there might be relevant ethical considerations um, that need to um, be looked at in certain ethical contexts. Like, does it matter if we're, say, transplanting a Down syndrome human brain organoid into an animal model versus a neurotypical brain organoid into an animal model? Um, and are, is something like, say, uh, Genetic research on Down syndrome, which is the purpose uh, that's often um, uh, the intention behind some of these chimeric experiments with Down syndrome brain organoid transplantations, um, is, the, is the science that comes out of that research actually going to benefit uh, the Down syndrome community? <coughs> and does the Down syndrome community actually even want uh, this kind of research and the creation of new genetic interventions uh, for uh, for this uh, 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 for their community, right? There we go. So moving on then to clinical applications and experimentation. Um, so here uh, is one of the more uh, populous uh, ones, as you can see. There's more variety of topics within uh, this uh, particular space uh, of it. One is ethics within drug development. Uh, of uh, 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 with organoid ethics here. So for one is there's this uh, issue, this question about line blurring in precision uh, medicine and personalized medicine. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in just a bit um, and explain what exactly do I mean by line blurring, or what's often meant by line blurring in precision medicine. Um, but there's also, again, uh, questions about the usefulness uh, of organoids in drug development too, because they are imperfect models um, in a variety of ways. One of the way, well, the, the, the two main problems with organoid models in terms of their use in um, either preclinical applications or clinical applications um, as a model is that they have what's uh, what's sometimes referred to as a plumbing <coughs> as a plumbing and scaffolding problem. Right? So if you think about what an organoid is, it's a sphere of tissue that's sitting in medium, in nutrient medium, right? And so that means that the sphere is getting appropriate nutrients on its surface from the outside, but the core is not getting any kind of nutrients at all, or at least not enough of what uh, it really needs. And so what happens is when that core doesn't get enough of the nutrients that it needs, the, uh, the core begins to undergo necrosis, means it, the core begins to die, and the organoid begins to kind of fall apart from the inside out, begins to rot from the inside out. So the plumbing problem is, how do you get nutrients into that core so that the organoid can maintain its structure? And the scaffolding problem is kind of similar, but as, as a sphere, organoids can't really grow really <coughs> big, right? So uh, it's not a, a fully stable structure for them. So it's this plumbing and scaffolding problem that makes them uh, somewhat imperfect. And that's also one of the reasons why researchers will transplant organoids as a way to solve the plumbing and scaffolding problem, right? So there's this question about their usefulness within drug development for those particular science reasons. Um, but there's also questions about, say, well, who is going to reimburse for the experiments of drug development for, uh, uh, and care that comes with, like, say, the drug discovery for this stuff? Who pays for this, right? Um, and then, of course, there's questions of safety and efficacy. Um, if you're using organoids for uh, drug discovery, um, how do you know that it's going to be safe and effective to move to clinical trials? 
Um, and that's also one of the reasons why people, uh, some will argue that animal models will sort of in a way always be necessary um, and that organoids may be just an extra preclinical step. Um, you have uh, some uh, applications when it comes to embryonic and embryoid research. A question here might be, do organoids further require the reduction of embryonic stem cells for research, right? Because uh, there's this question about embryonic stem cell use, and you can make uh, various kinds of embryoids, embryo-like entities, uh, without the use of embryonic stem cells. Most of the time, though, uh, right now, um, there is a mixture of, a of use of embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells to make embryoid models. However, there are various advancements that have come forth to show that you can make certain kinds of embryo and em embryoid-like models um, with just induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, in fact, there was an experiment that came out of uh, Australia recently, uh, where they created blastoids, uh, blastocyst-like uh, models, solely from induced pluripotent stem cells, and they did it by accident, and they called it, and they called it the eye blastoid. Um, and of course, when they did this by accident, uh, they immediately rang their ethics committee and said, "Hey, um, this thing is uh, turning into uh, a blastocyst kind of like uh, entity. Uh, what should we do?" Um, and they basically said, you probably should cancel the experiment and put a stop to it for their developing if it might, you know, continue down that developmental path, right? Um, so it's, I will, I'll, I'll say that it's not, um, that this question about does it require embryonic stem cell reduction um, is an important ethical issue, but that doesn't eliminate the ethical problems that are associated perhaps with embryoid models, right? Did you, did you have a... No, no, no. <laughs> um, there's also ethical questions about first in human trials, right? Uh, what happens in, tr in terms of ethics and how do we ethically assess um, transplanting, uh, brain, uh, transplanting organoids uh, into, um, uh, into people? Um, or even, say, utilizing drugs that have been developed solely from organoids and then moving to the clinical trial stage. There's this question there in terms of the uh, first in human trials on that front. And then there's questions of, well, what about you know, first in children trials? Um, some have argued that yes, we should advance to first in children trials uh, as so long as various safety assessments have been done uh, and as long as everything uh, we've done our best to, uh, to our ability to ensure the safety and efficacy uh, of this treatment uh, for children. Right? Um, talks about, you know, from moving bench to bedside here. There's also questions about choosing study populations. Yeah? Can you explain a bit further the, the first one tells uh, argument? The what? The, the first one children argument. Can I repeat the first in children argument? Yeah, I didn't understand. So, um, what are they actually arguing that we should? Uh, Primar primarily because um, it's about trying to uh, reduce uh, suffering. And if it seems that uh, based on various kinds of studies, including, say, some animal studies, uh, or based on, if it's, say, drug development, um, if the drugs, after in numerous sort of testing, especially if we're talking about, say, personalized uh, medicine, if it seems that the organoids are responding well to a particular kind of drug treatment, um, then it seems, uh, and, and we undergo other kinds of various safety and precautionary procedures, um, ensuring and, and, and have extreme kind of like a hawkish, watchful gaze over the children um, and, and intervene if anything might go wrong, um, then yes, it seems like this could be a viable uh, uh, solution for certain kinds of conditions for children. So the argument goes is that is basically sort of saying, culminating into the position of yes, we should advance um, uh, the use of organoids into first in children trials um, because ultimately, and, and basically the argument sort of goes that ultimately um, that's what we will have to do eventually if the whole point of using organoids is for uh, medicine, we will eventually have to go to uh, clinical trial with them some stage, right? 
Um, some argue that the stage is now. Others <coughs> would say, eh, no, there's still more stuff to, uh, to try and sort out here scientifically um, uh, and sort of safety and efficacy wise before we can really go to first in children trials, let alone maybe first in, um, uh, uh, first in human trials. Um, but of course, as I, as I mentioned, some of the concerns might be something like, say, complex translational trials, right? Um, it might, this might be sort of complicated in terms of how you are setting up the clinical trial, right? Because a lot of the times when you're doing, say, drug trials, there's a double-blind study um, that's done. But in, if, in the case of, say, like organotransplantation, you can't really have something like a kind of double-blind study, so you have to set up the trial <coughs> in different ways. Um, there's also, of course, the, the concern about protecting children. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned before, maybe, like we shouldn't go to first-in-children trials because we want to make sure that the children are protected um, uh, uh, to an extreme high degree because they are a vulnerable population. Um, then there's uh, more, like say, risk benefits uh, uh, argument here, where if we do a risk benefit assessment, we will probably see that the benefits outweigh the risks, or maybe vice versa, uh, safety and efficacy. But we also want to ensure that first in human trials are for therapeutic purposes only, and not for, say, enhancement purposes. So this ethics of uh, being sort of drawn on the lines of therapy versus enhancement. There's also questions about gene editing uh, here, too. Uh, could gene editing organoids further complicate ethical issues with gene therapy? Um, because if we're using organoids as, say, a tool on the one hand for uh, medicine uh, in terms of transplantation, we can also think about that <coughs> in terms of a tool for helping with trying to develop some sort of gene therapy or model uh, to help with developing gene therapy, right? Um, so. I, in a way, you can kind of, the way I like to think about the, the ethical quandary of uh, gene editing um, and gene therapy with, um, with organoids is if you were to uh, go to an American and say, hey, um, imagine a company uh, has, a, a pharmaceutical company um, in the United States has CRISPR-Cas9, a gene editing pair of scissors in one hand and then your organoid in another. Would you want a pharmaceutical company in the United States to have that? Uh, and I think a lot of Americans would say no, uh, you know, maybe because they distrust uh, the companies uh, in the United States uh, for having both of these tools uh, in hand. Right? Um, so there's questions uh, there in terms of risk benefits, but not, not a lot has been discussed uh, in this space about it. Um, so that's why there's so few there. I mentioned organoid transplants as a, uh, and this, this first in human uh, trials is mostly, is, is, is somewhat in the context of organoid transplantation. Um, but organoid transplants here uh, are thinking about, you know, this is the best possible option. We have to have uh, you know, a lot of cautiousness about this. Um, maybe there's also the idea is that full organ transplant delays um, are not problematic. Uh, also, this might be a less invasive alternative, so maybe the idea here is that, well, someone who needs a liver transplant, maybe we can give them a liver organoid transplant uh, to help them uh, along until maybe there is a viable full liver transplant alternative, right? Maybe so we can do like a bit of a partial transplants here that might that might help. Maybe organoids could be used in terms of transplantation as a way of alleviating the organ donor crisis, right? Because there are uh, too few organs to go around. Um, so that's one argument sort of in favor of organoid transplantation um, as a means to mitigate <coughs> uh, the issue with uh, organ, uh, don uh, organ donation, right? Um, promising applications uh, are sometimes uh, mentioned. Um, of course, again, with organoids, they have similar mechanisms to their uh, in vivo counterparts. Um, transplant for repairs, um, generally speaking, and not for enhancement purposes, so on and so forth. 
Uh, I've mentioned uh, personalized medicine and precision uh, medicine a little bit before. Uh, there's a kind of a big ethical question here, uh, which is, will organoids further blur the line between research and care? Because in, uh, in medical ethics, research ethics and clinical care ethics are treated as separate things, right? And you have different ways of doing ethics within ethics of clinical care versus ethics of research, right? And if we're sort of combining research with medical care more and more with something like, say, organoids for personalized medicine, then what's happening in the research is going to more directly impact the care that the patient is receiving, right? And this puts even more pressure on something like, say, research integrity, for instance, right? Because if you mess up with the research on an organoid and it's being used for um, medical care, uh, then you are also possibly screwing up uh, the care and treatment that uh, a particular patient is receiving. So there might be uh, a lot more responsibility now um, on researchers when it comes to uh, this blurring uh, of research and, uh, uh, and, and medical care, right? Furthermore, there's also issues of, like, say, building the infrastructure, right? Because at the moment, there's not really good, uh, good enough infrastructure for this to really happen very well. Uh, and if you don't have a good enough infrastructure for, uh, for something like precision medicine, it's not going to be effective and maybe um, harmful uh, to uh, patients. Uh, then, of course, there's this issue of something like clinical validation challenges, like say you have an N of 1 trial, right, where you have a trial that consists of a population of just one, right, and you have, what you can do is you can generate a bunch of different organoids, right, from this one patient, but nevertheless, the trial study, the trial population is just one, and statistically speaking, that's a bit complicated when you just have one patient in the study, right? Um, so that's kind of uh, the, the idea here, this, this, this question. And then of course organoids are uh, considered as promising applications. Um, they are referred to as promising applications, uh, generally speaking, and so we have to uh, sort of consider similar ethical issues as other promising applications within, uh, within the clinic uh, as well. Uh, there are also human develop, uh, development models, uh, and we may uh, want to consider uh, ethical issues to other kinds of human development models that might be similar uh, in ways. Um, may, uh, some have argued that as a promising application, we have a moral imperative <coughs> to pursue uh, organoid research to the furthest extent possible. Um, there's also, of course, uh, practical implementations that we need to consider in terms of the ethics there. Um, we have to consider some ethics about regenerative medicine, for instance, more risk benefits questions, um, and questions about their use as a reductionist model, right? Because if we're talking about organoids being used as models for in vivo counterparts, in certain ways, they are a, a reduction of a, uh, as a model, they are a reduction of what is actually happening uh, in vivo, right? So, and of course, we have to consider their variety of applications. So that's kind of what we see in, in the ethics literature about clinical applications and, and experiments. Any, any questions for me about, about this? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm not very sure about uh the precision aspect of the personalized medicine. What is the specificity of organoids there? Just that they allow personalized medicine? Or is there something more uh, specific going on with respect to organoids? So or what do they have to do with care? Uh, I didn't see that very much. Right. So with organoids, uh, they, they could be used as a form of personalized medicine. That's kind yeah. of one of the hopes of them. So I, I gave the example earlier of like say for cancer, um, what you can do with something like a tumoroid, you can take the, the tumor tissue from the cancer patient, turn it into say a variety of tumoroids, 
uh, hit these tumoroids with different doses of chemo to see then how best how the patient might best respond to particular dosage uh, of chemo uh, and for a duration of, right. So that's an example of personalized and precision medicine um, that organoids could be used for there. Now, in this in that example again, there's a blurring of research and and care, right? Because the care, the treatment of the of the patient is going to be more and more heavily based on the experimental research um, and the experimental research and uh, clinical care, uh, the ethics of these, uh, of these areas have typically been considered primarily in separate silos, right? Research ethics um, has, uh, has a variety of uh, ethical questions that you won't really see in, in clinical care. And when you blur this line between <coughs> research and, and care, the, the ethics can then become kind of muddled. Organoids are, are probably an example of this. I would, I, I would argue at least. Organoids are an example of this. They're an extension of a kind of consequence that we, you would see within precision medicine and, uh, uh, and personalized medicine. Uh, but in a way, they're not they might not necessarily bring in uh, something completely new. I think they would be bringing um, some slightly different contexts that are probably relevant um, to consider. But I would argue that the overarching question, um, uh, the overarching questions are quite the same. But the you know. Will organoids further blur this line between research and care? Do they blur the line between research and care? I think you can make a case um, for uh, the fact that they uh, can and will uh, blur that line. And whether or not this is problematic is perhaps up for debate because some researchers say, yeah, this is what we want. Like, of course we want uh, more precision medicine and personalized medicine, of course. We want uh, research to be more directly involved in the care of the patient, right? Um, so whether or not that's a good thing is, uh, I think, the big debate here, right? Thanks. No worries. Never <laughs> yeah, it's re it's really fascinating. And already, just like just for two con just for two themes here, this stuff is getting like really complicated, and there's a lot of variety of contexts. Uh, here that need further kind of further exploration. I didn't bother putting the numbers up here in terms of how many times these uh, reasons or topics sort of uh, popped up, but a lot of times these reasons, um, the, even the broad reasons, the number of times they pop up in the literature is like once. So this doesn't necessarily give you, I think, the best impression of how in depth or how shallow the conversations are and how much more we really need to talk about this sort of stuff. Um, this is really just sort of trying to tell you there's some of this out there, but a lot of this stuff is actually quite underdeveloped. Um, so if you're asking me, some, sometimes if you might ask me, well, what's the argument? I might say there really isn't any because <laughs> because the argument isn't really that in depth. It's really just kind of like, <coughs> we ought to consider this aspect. We ought to consider this reason, right? Um, but there's nothing really like in-depth or substantial. Sometimes there is, um, and sometimes there isn't. One, the example, for instance, of sometimes there's a lot of in-depth um, uh, conversation, though, it comes from this particular theme, for instance, about commercialization and consent. Uh, a lot of stuff, though, uh, surrounding commercialization and consent falls into the topic of organoid biobanking, right? So. You can think of biobanks as like you know banks where you have uh, uh, any kind of tissue, right? Sperm banks uh, are a form of biobanking, uh, as an example, or uh, an egg bank, uh, for a fertility bank is another example of a kind of biobank. But instead of thinking of something like a sperm bank or an egg bank, you can think of an organoid biobank as just a biobank full of different kinds of organoids and tissue, basically, right? Uh, so. There are ethical quandaries, perhaps, when dealing with organoid biobanking, right? Some of it might be benefit sharing in biobanking, right? Who should get the benefits uh, when it comes to biobanking? Or who should 
how do you how do you share the benefits of biobanking uh, generally? And that can, benefits can mean both scientific benefits, um, like say data, uh, financial benefits, uh, of course. Uh, uh, the, you can think about um, me medical benefits, who should get the medical benefits uh, there. Uh, benefit sharing is something that needs to be uh, considered uh, within uh, an order of biobank, right? Questions about biobanking infrastructure. How, what's the best form of infrastructure to set up for something like uh, an organoid biobank? <coughs> um, there's also uh, complex donor relations. Uh, when it comes to, you know, you have to get the material for an organoid biobank from somewhere, right? It's going to come from people, right? And so if people are going to donate their tissue, what is the relation between the donor and the organoid within the organoid biobank? So for instance, does the, uh, does the biobank own the organoid or does the donor own the organoid, right? Um, and maybe the, uh, Maybe they do, and maybe they don't. It's, uh, there's, there's questions there. Consent for biobanking. What form of consent is best for uh, for biobanking here? Um, do you give, uh, you know, say a broad opt-in consent, opt-out consent, for instance? Uh, questions about data sharing, and then there's also this question of uh, what sorts of future goals should uh, biobanks have uh, as well, right? Broadly speaking, there is a question about commercialization uh, and organoids, right? Um, how should organoids be ethically commercialized, if at all, right? Are organoids kind of more like organs, where the commercialization of organs is generally frowned upon, right? Uh, or there might be some arguments, uh, maybe, maybe we should think of organoids like organs in, in, that, in that fashion, but organoids are not organs. Right? They're only organ-like. And so maybe we have to think about this special category for organoids and say, well, maybe organoids can and should be commercialized, but not full organs. Right? Uh, so there are, there's this uh, idea that, yes, uh, maybe if we are going to commercialize, uh, caution is, of course, required for this. Right? Because uh, for one thing, organoids, of course, contain human DNA. Right? And if they contain human DNA, you're selling an organoid, you are effectively giving somebody, you know, your DNA, right? Uh, maybe uh, there, there's some arguments against commercialization, uh, one of which is that commercialization of organoids doesn't necessarily lead to innovative therapies or innovative techniques. Um, sometimes, uh, the, the, of course, the, the other way uh, around is sometimes argued that commercialization will, of course, lead to uh, innovation in, in medicine, right? So uh, some, you, you have arguments uh, a little bit on, on both sides here, right? The question of the, the role uh, of commercialization itself, right? Um, there's concerns over the lack of uh, reciprocity here, right? Because if you are commercializing an organoid, uh, who is getting the money? Right? Do, do, should we actually pay donors for their tissue when we're commercializing organoids, or should we not? Should it be a totally altruistic thing and say commercialized biobanks be able to uh, receive uh, the money itself? Right? Um, there's also a question over control over the organoids. Who has the final say and control over what happens to the organoid? Right? Um, is it going to be the researcher? Is it going to be the biobank? Is it going to be, you know, like the executive? Is it going to be the donor, right? Who has control over what happens to the organoid in the commercialization process? Um, should the government be involved in terms of control here? And how much? Um, there's also this question about the creation of value. Does commercialization of an organoid in some way, shape, or form create more value within the organoid itself? Right? Or does it maybe possibly destroy value? There's this uh, idea about the disentanglement of organoid values, right? Um, and the disentanglement of the relation between the donor of the organoid and, uh, and the organoid itself within the biobank. How do you disentangle the value uh, between the donor and the organoid? Because if in a way you could uh, disentangle this complex relation between the donor and the organoid, it might make it easier to actually and ethically, more easier and more ethically, able to commercialize organoids if you were able to disentangle the value 
uh, between the donor and the organ itself. Uh, there's this question, of course, a lot of this sort of comes under these sort of uh, two different paradigms of, say, gift versus market paradigm when it comes to, say, like in, uh, uh, in, in organ commercialization, right? The main arguments within organ commercialization is like, no, we shouldn't commercialize um, uh, selling organs, right, because uh, it should be a gift, right? If you are going to give somebody an organ, like say I'm going to give you a kidney, right, it should be just as an altruistic gift. That's the paradigm that it ought to fall under, as opposed to, no, I'll give you my kidney for, you know, uh, $10,000, right? That's the, the, the market paradigm here. Uh, the idea is that, well, here's the thing though, right? Organoids, as a biomedical technology, are super expensive. They're really, really expensive to make. They're really, really expensive to maintain. Commercializing them might be able to lower the costs to make and use organoids, and thus uh, you might be able to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, reach more people with them. Uh, I'm being told it's time for discussion. So, but unfortunately, I have a few more things to talk about here. Um, but I'll run through these uh, really quickly, uh, just so that uh, we have some time to discuss. Um, consent, of course, I already sort of talked about this. Which forms of consent are the most appropriate uh, for, for organoid ethics and organoid research? Um, broad uh, consent, opt-in consent. There's a form of consent out there, um, sometimes called uh, consent for governance, where the donor is not is consenting to how the organoid will be governed uh, within, uh, as opposed to how it will be used. Um, of course, questions about ownership, uh, questions about vulnerable groups here. And content uh, and consent, of course, is like uh, deeply entwined within commercialization within organoid ethics here. Um, organoid ontology, unfortunately, this is the, uh, probably the most complicated one uh, out of them all. Um, and unfortunately, since it's time for discussion, I can't really talk about this too much. Um, I'll say this, like, in terms of this space, the biggest question, uh, the, the one that's most talked about here is the cerebral organoid model status, right? I showed you that picture of a brain organoid with eyes. And there's this question of, well, do brain organoids have consciousness? Can they develop consciousness? Um, what, what are, if they have consciousness, should they then have moral status, right? And to what degree should we give them moral standing if they have consciousness, right? Um, there's also, of course, similar questions with something like embryoid and gastroloid models. Since they're embryo-like entities, should they have moral status kind of similar or not to embryos themselves? Um, so that's a, an interesting question to explore. Uh, there. And the last thing I will uh, try to uh, uh, hurriedly uh, talk about and just mention is this theme of research ethics and research integrity, um, where within research ethics you can see that there is this layer, there are these layers of ethical complexity within organoid ethics uh, on its own, right? Um, so we, maybe we need more time to unpack the ethics of organoids, and given the fact that I'm forced to uh, go into discussion mode with you right now, I think we really do need more time to unpack the ethics of organoids. Um, and of course we need further justifications of use. There's a lot of different frameworks out there for this. And one last thing I think I'll, I'll say really quickly and then we can go into discussion is this area of research integrity, which is uh, really talking about things like communication, guidance, and oversight for all of this research. With communication, um, we have to ask this question of how do we ensure scientists don't overhype organoids and organoid frontier technology, right? So how do we ensure that scientists don't go overboard and say, these things are the next best thing since sliced bread, right? They are the next best thing uh, in medicine, right? And you know, they, they can do all different things. They can help with regenerative medicine, medicine, precision medicine, disease modeling, you know, it slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries, right? How do we ensure that, uh, that researchers don't overhype it? And how can we ensure that, the, uh, that media communication uh, accurately portrays what these things are and what they can do?
And who, uh, in terms of guidance, uh, how should we formulate our guidelines? And also for oversight, um, who should be responsible for oversight of this stuff? Should it be existing stem cell ethics committees? Should we make new ones? It's unclear exactly who should have uh, exact oversight and control over uh, this uh, form of research. Uh, so with that, I will end it there and open it up for discussion. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you need a break or we can just I have a yeah. Okay, no break, no break. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy, happy to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it maybe a, a, a strange question, but uh, you, you, you made a review of, of uh, all the sort of arguments and ethics issues that people have brought up, people have studied or, or not. Um, what would you say are the issues, the ethical issues that are under-talked or omitted um, that uh, scientists, that um, uh, practitioners, that, that philosophers should be actually discussed. I mean, you, you do mention a, a bit the, the personalized medicine, the, the, the blur division, and I think it's interesting, but I don't know if you wanted to, if you have some ideas of things like, okay, we are talking too much about this and we forget about, about this. And yeah, so. I can give you a, a couple of examples of this that are, that are slightly different from what from what you, you uh, a little bit different from like say what you're asking. So, for instance, I mentioned with commercialization and consent, that was in this review um, one of the largest, <coughs> if not the largest, uh, theme in terms of the number of reason mentions that occurred. But all of the papers and all the arguments that came from commercialization and consent came from one research center in the Netherlands. So there was a lot of in-depth argumentation that was happening, but there wasn't really any kind of response that was occurring with this commercialization and consent uh, 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 discussion. So a lot of what, we, what we're thinking about, what we see when it comes to, say, consent with organoids, it's dominated by something like, say, the consent for governance uh, idea, uh, wherein you know, a patient isn't opting into particular kinds of experiments or giving a kind of broad consent where it's like, do whatever you want. Um, they're uh, saying, no, you should, you, uh, I will uh, consent to you being able to uh, govern over my organoids within um, this, uh, uh, within a kind of governance structure, right? That idea, again, comes from one particular research group and is dominate and dominates the, uh, that theme. Um, and there's not really any other kind of ethics literature and ethics of organoids that says, that's a great idea, <coughs> no, that's a bad idea, right? Uh, so it's a standalone sort of thing, right? Um, I, would, I, I, I personally think that that's also an area where ethicists ought to uh, continue working um, and continue to develop more in-depth uh, conversations around. Um, another uh, one, uh, I, I, even though I didn't really get to talk about it uh, uh, a lot, was the uh, the brain organoid um, uh, ethics debate. Because a lot of the brain organoid ethics uh, debate sort of centers around this question of what's the moral standing of a brain organoid, right? And usually there's this question about, well, do, can brain organoids think? Do they have consciousness? Do they have a, uh, a moral minimum of kind of consciousness, right? How do you measure it, et cetera, et cetera. That I particularly think, while it's an important debate to probably have, in a way, if ethicists are focusing on that so much, they might overlook other relevant ethical issues relating to brain organoids and brain organoid research. So one way uh, I've tried to help with that has, has been a couple of ways. One sort of is to show, hey, uh, this is perhaps uh, going to be a growing issue, and we don't want to turn this brain organoid debate or an embryoid debate into something similar as, like, say, the abortion debate, where it's in a way often reduced to this question of personhood and fetal ontology and all this sort of stuff, 
And there's other relevant ethical questions relating to abortion that don't necessarily center around fetal personhood, right? So that's one thing I sort of, I've, I've done in my work. And the other thing has been to sort of give an, uh, an instance of this where I talk about, say, uh, the value conflict between using human brain organoids for autism research, and that may be in contrast with, uh, and in conflict with the values found within the neurodiversity movement, right? And so you, you can see the, the ethical discussion that could happen there without this need for going into well, can a brain organoid think? That's you know, and, and grounding the ethics within this question of well, brain organoid personhood or, or, or something along those lines. So that's like a kind of another area where I think like we we ought to sort of focus our attention a bit more there. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe I missed it because there was a lot. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, um, an issue that I wonder whether it is being researched or whether you think it should be researched is about uh, the, the, the controllability or the getting out of control, uh, like the sort of uh, arguments you see a lot in, uh, in, in, in AI research or virus research that. Uh, well, you can work on these things, but at some point you cannot uh, foresee the consequences. Uh, it gets a life of its own. Um, I don't know whether this is here possible, given that you're in a petri dish and so on, but can something escape the life of the, 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 the laboratory somehow? I mean, or via a virus, you know? Uh, like, I guess these living materials, they can get certain diseases too, that are new, and then accidentally get out of the of the lab, or maybe in sort of a more science fiction, that, that they would become bigger and I mean, and, and, and tr that they can transport themselves somehow. I mean, these kind of considerations are in, the, in any way taken into account? Uh, you see it a little bit, um, but it's not really a major concern. The areas where it is of the most concern are really with. Um, First and foremost, the embryoids. So I mentioned that experiment from Australia where they had um, accidentally created a blastoid, a blastocyst-like uh, entity from induced placental <coughs> stem cells. They had no intention of making that complex of an entity. It's just what the stem cells wanted to do, right? And they were concerned that it was going to further develop within the embryogenesis phases. Right? They were concerned that, oh, well, it, if it's in a blastocyst stage, maybe it's going to develop into a gastroloid. Like, you can get, get to the stage of gastrulation. Um, and in, in, embryo, in embryogenesis, um, we typically don't allow uh, embryos, full-fledged embryos, to develop beyond the stage of gastrulation or the development of the primitive streak, or 14 days after uh, conception, whichever comes first. So that is probably where you see uh, most of that kind of concern pop up. Some of that is also true for brain organoids. Um, if somehow a brain organoid were to, say, further develop uh, in a way, it's not necessarily a big concern there, primarily because of what I mentioned before with the plumbing and scaffolding problem, right? right. Yeah. Um, so it's not the biggest concern there, but I think you see some associations with something like say <coughs> Frankenstein, for instance, uh, when we're talking about something like assembloids, where you're fusing, say, two different kinds of brain organoids together, or you're fusing, um, say, a brain organoid with a spinal cord organoid and a muscle organoid, that is uh, a bit sort of Frankensteinian, where people sort of get concerned. Um, you see this with sort of these on-a-chip systems, where you'll take an organoid, put it within a kind of plastic case that allows for microfluidics to run through as a way of trying to get around that plumbing and scaffolding problem. Um, and then you connect that, this, uh, 
plastic case with the, say, like a brain organoid in it and run tubes through it. Um, and then you connect that tube into another case with, like, say, uh, a cardiac organoid. Then you connect it to another case with like a liver organ on it. And then you start to create these kind of body on a chip systems. That's where people start to say like, ooh, this is starting to like kind of take a life of its own, maybe. Um, but that's not really um, induced <coughs> from the organ itself. It's from the researcher uh, perspective. So it's more like, again, a little bit more like Frankenstonian kind of concern uh, rather than like, oh, well, uh, these things can take on a life of their, <coughs> of their own. When it comes to like something like, say, virology, and trying to develop, say, uh, viruses with them, normal safety concerns will apply when it comes to uh, 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 virus research there. Same thing with like bacterial research, if you're doing something like w uh, with that. So that's kind of the where, where all that sort of is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had a question about uh, the design of your research, and more particularly how you defined reasons and what your inclusion criteria were. Because the, a lot of them strike me more like topics or something like that than really as reasons. Yeah. For, uh, so I was just wondering how did you decide what should be indexed um, and why did you call it reasons? Right, so this is based off of a uh, review methodology by uh, Sofair and Stretch, um, and they call this a systematic review of reasons. Um, in their uh, particular review, it's also kind of, reasons is slightly a bit of a misnomer, and furthermore, given that I was building this review uh, off of their work, they also don't give any definition for what a reason is, right? So uh, a reason for <coughs> uh, included maybe concepts of things like concerns. Um, so it's not necessarily just like a, uh, a structure that, or a piece uh, that you might find in a formal argument, right? So it's not necessarily just uh, building blocks of arguments, which some folks might think of as what reasons are. They are these building blocks within a grander argumentative scheme. Um, I really just kind of went down into this and looked for um, anything that might be used as a, a way of thinking about uh, an ethic. So it might be an ethical consideration, an ethical concern as part, that might be part of this. <coughs> um, and basically trying to uh, piecemeal these slightly smaller different concepts apart from each other and then sort of regroup them together within topics, right? So. It is, it is true that like these reasons, will, as I cluster them together, they become more and more topic related. Um, but as you get further and further down, they become a bit more normative. Sometimes though, the other is that I don't make any distinction between say normative reasons and uh, descriptive reasons, right? So that's another thing here too, is why you might see um, uh, some, top, or some reasons in here that seem to be more like topics is that they are more descriptive uh, reasons and descriptive rationale than they are, say, parts of normative arguments arguing one way or another. Because a lot of the ethics literature in Ethics of Organoids is really descriptive, or even talking about this could be a position, or that can be a position. Um, so that's kind of what, what I'm sort of going off of here for that. Um, and for and again for the inclusion criteria, um, it really was kind of uh, just sort of basic and simple inclusion criteria where um, the articles uh, had to be peer reviewed. I, I mean for the reasons. Oh, just for the reasons. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. For the reasons, that's that's really kind of it. Um, but I also made distinctions in terms of say what might be uh, background information. Um, so there were some stuff. Uh, like say within an introduction that is background information and scientific information. Um, sometimes though, the scientific information is relevant to the reason, and so sometimes it blends together. But anything that was purely scientific, I put as sort of background and it's not really relevant. Um, other things like call to actions, um, I had coded for, but basically, again, did not code as reasons. They are calls to action. Um, and further kinds of ethical questions that are raised, again, 
questions, not necessarily reasons um, in of themselves. So there's a few, there's a few <coughs> different, uh, different kinds of reasons that are in there. And given the fact that most of the ethics literature is descriptive literature and not necessarily normative, it, it kind of gets weird in terms of blurring together because you normally treat those two things separately and distinct. But if I had just done descriptive ethics or normative ethics literature and normative reasons or versus descriptive reasons, um, I would have very, very m much fewer um, thematics uh, uh, or themes that you would that you would see here. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 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 Um, so my question perhaps leads a little bit away from the ethics um, side of it. Um, I apologize for that. No, it's actually, like so, some of this too is like some metaphysical questions are in here too. Yeah. yeah no, I'm I'm specifically interested um, in this representational relations between um, organ rights and the human body that you mentioned at one point. That there are potential for being alternatives to animal models. Um, because it seems to me, um, so I don't know much about that issue, but, but it seems to me that this representational relation is somewhat different from the, from the model um, target um, relation. Um, in that, that if I take uh, pro and organoids, uh, I need to have a, a donor. So that in a sense what this, what this organoid then is, is um, uh, so it is a, a representation of that very particular um, individual, right? And so generalizations based off these organoids seems to be more like extrapolation than being a representation for a target system. So I wonder whether the claim that this could um, make animal models obsolete is, is somehow I don't know, too exaggerated, or I don't, I don't really see the... Um, so is, is the concern that um, we need more donors, right, in order to make this model an accurate represent uh, representative model? Yeah, that would that would be the question. I mean, this yeah. Is how so I'll say that. Oops. I'll say that a lot of um, uh, that a lot of source material for growing an organoid comes from biobanks themselves, and biobanks have a variety uh, of donors, um, including both living and dead. Uh, so. Biobanks try to gather as much uh, biomedical material as, as possible, <coughs> as much material as possible, so that they can send the material to researchers and researchers will grow organoids from that material for basic, res for basic research purposes, right? And again, like if you, if you want to think about organoid research, you can think about it in, in a way of, like say, this context of basic research where you might want to study some uh, uh, developmental model, for instance, uh, or you want to do uh, just some, uh, yeah, some basic virology research. Um, maybe you can, and, and, and that is a slightly different than, say, if you're using organoids in terms of precision medicine, personalized medicine, right, um, as, as an example. So yeah, and actually like some of this concern of like, well, you know, the, the material in terms of precision medicine and personalized medicine, where's the material coming from? It's coming just from one person, right? And that's kind of a validation concern when it comes to that research. And if we're going to actually sort of apply this research to, you know, care, especially for that one person who gave us the original source material, right? So what you're saying is exactly true in terms of like say like precision medicine like is this really a valid model for for this um, and don't we still need to do like some like say uh, uh, animal models uh, and use animal models like to help validate this sort of thing that's why like what you're saying exactly uh, is exactly uh, the argument that a lot of people make that organoids are great models but they're imperfect for a variety of different uh, not just that, you know, there's uh, a lot of these organoids are coming from maybe uh, a few different biobanks, and while they have a variety of donors, you know, that's still a small sample pool. Um, and maybe organoids can be used as a stage of preclinical trial that comes before an animal model, and then you go to the clinical uh, phase, and if we're talking about translational purposes. Um, so, 
th this is why the argument uh, when we're talking about like the arguments of like say reduce, refine, replace uh, for animal models, a lot of people will say, well, organoids are great for reducing animal models and refining animal models, uh, or, or demanding re for the reduction and demanding for the refinement, but they won't ever replace animal models because animal models will always have um, some benefits uh, that. Uh, organoid models won't, right? Because organoid models, if you want to study the immune system, you can't do that with an organoid, right? Uh, you, it's, it's not a full fleshed out system. You need a full system like an animal to study something like the immune system, right? So that's why folks will say like, well, we still require animal models for some things like that. Um, but others will say, well, no, we, I mean, we're, we're, we are, we're on the verge of being able to do things like make, say, these body on a chip systems, right? And we can do uh, the, these immune studies very effectively, and they have much more representative, you know, translatability. It's an ongoing scientific debate, basically. So what you're pinpointing is stuff that's kind of an ongoing debate uh, at at this very moment. And unfortunately, I don't really have an answer for you in terms of uh, uh, which way is Correct. So. I would like to continue this question, but on the ethical side. So, so at least organoids are of the same species than us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, which is one of the problem with animal models. Mm -hmm. So, it, it seems to me very tempting for the researcher to try to improve organoids to 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 overcome their imperfection to have better models, but to overcome the imperfection is to make them more like a real organ or to have body on a ship, so to have a system. So in all cases, it's just, what, what would you say about the ethical problem? Because you, you seem to claim that they are okay because they are not like us, but the more we transform in them like us to overcome animal models, the more problematic it is. You know, I, I don't worry about consciousness of a bunch of cells on a petri dish, but a complete physiology or metabolism is trickier for me. Yeah, exactly. I'm asking you. Yeah, so uh, basically what, I, what I've been doing here is mostly just um, trying to give an accurate description of what the current ethical literature is. My own personal uh, take on, on all of this um, when it comes to something like uh, what you're talking about there, um, one way I like to try and think about it is uh, if we're thinking about this from uh, a kind of organoid-centered approach, um, where we're beginning to think about our ethics from the organoid itself, I like to sort of begin thinking about um, what is the level of complexity here, right? Is it a simple entity where it's just like, a couple of different kinds of tissue? Or is it something more like, say, an assembly where we have a frontal uh, brain cortex and a hind brain cortex and they're fused together and you see axonal uh, migrations that are happening and there's much more intricate structures that are uh, happening. There's more features and functions um, and, and much more organized structure that's happening within that entity. I think that level of complexity if we're focusing uh, on the organoid itself, requires us to have uh, more <coughs> ethical reflections about uh, what this entity is, and of course questions if it's something like a brain organoid, questions about uh, maybe developing some kind of morally minimal consciousness and what to do if that were to happen, uh, given this level of complexity. And the same thing I would argue is also true for the embryoid models, where the, the further you go into the stages of embryogenesis, the more complex the entity you're making, and the more kinds of ethical um, uh, uh, reflections that you would have to do. Now, if we're thinking uh, not necessarily from an organoid-centered approach, and we're looking at it in terms of their translation, and we're looking at more either patient-oriented approach or a society-oriented approach, um, I think that we have to 
again, take in relevant contexts here. What sort of lens are we looking at this through? If we're looking at this, say, for uh, like the example of, uh, I take like the brain organoid example of using brain organoids for personalized medicine research for autism, um, I would argue that the research there uh, lies in complete uh, contrast and conflict with the, the values that are found within something like, say, the neurodiversity movement. Because the neurodiversity movement says, Autism isn't a disease, a deficit, or disorder. It's not something that needs to really be fixed, right? By the way, just for your information, yeah. in this university, the university hospital, I can declare to you that autism is not considered as a disease. <laughs> yeah, great. For a university, for a yeah. center of autism, of our university does not consider autism anybody on the spectrum as having a disease. Well, so that's, that's the official yeah. position of that <laughs> university. That's, that's good. Um, but uh, unfortunately, when you, when you look at uh, organoid science mm -hmm. uh, uh, on something like that, um, what you see is you see a, um, a very uh, medical model of disability that is integrated within the organoid science, mm -hmm. right? So when I think about the, the application side of things, I want to really, I, I really want to focus more on things like the value of the of the design and uh, of the of the technology, the value of the research aims uh, themselves, uh, and the values that are found within the uh, target population, um, and trying to integrate the target population's values within the science uh, of organoids itself. So that's really, that's kind of my take uh, on it. it and my, my take on a lot of organoid ethics is very much a kind of contextualist approach. Because as you can see here, there's a variety of different contexts uh, of organoids uh, in terms of their research, and also just a variety of different kinds of organoids. And it necessitates focusing on the, uh, the relevant contexts of the, the matter, and even uh, sort of demanding ethicists to take a kind of pluralist approach. Um, it's not appropriate to use, say, an animal ethics framework when talking about chimeras um, and transplanting brain organoids into animal models. It's not appropriate to use an animal, um, an animal model uh, framework there, ethical framework there, and apply it to uh, transplanting a brain organoid into a human being. So you would require fundamentally different um, moral frameworks. Um, because those are fundamentally different contexts. Um, so that's kind of my take uh, on, on it, basically. It's sort of the, it's funny, I'll do the, I want to do the same question, but in a third sense. So we did, we did the like science sense, we did the ethics -y sense, I want to do the kind of sociological sense. I want to make you really kind of speculate, or really just kind of hear your experience, because I thought it was really interesting to see a the logo of a uh, research animal protection organization on your slide, and my, partly. So my my question, this is kind of vague, but I, I just I think it's really interesting. And I'm, what's the discourse around that been like? What has your have you had a chance to really interact with some of these folks? What has that been like? Because again, speaking of uh, we're at the very end there. Uh, speaking of worries about hype cycles. Um, it's something, that's, it's something that, that, that I've been that I've been concerned about in this space is 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 you know you get two promising organoid results and you know people are people are going to start lobbying to close down the, the veterinary you know the research veterinary arm of the biology department right. um, and so I wonder what that's what that's been like because I put it this way you're the first person I've had the chance to talk to who I think has really worked on the ground perhaps with some of those folks so I'm really interested just to hear your kind of socio cultural thoughts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You used to do Max House before. <laughs> you do? <laughs> I know you worked with one of the protection groups before. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, uh, basically, uh, I mean, for, for my project, the, uh, the only like, kind of socio, the sociological uh, quote unquote uh, research that I'm doing is asking researchers and clinicians who work with organoids what are their perspectives. 
uh, on all these different ethical issues. True. Um, so I don't have any kind of empirical evidence to kind of give you about this sort of stuff. But from my experience, um, working with Pusti um, I was I stayed with them in, uh, in The Hague uh, for a, a few months on secondment um, and, and doing research with them and basically uh, uh, talking to them about uh, what exactly it is they do, how they function, how they've changed over time. Pufti of Rai is kind of an interesting organization in that they used to be a kind of like what you were describing, a very radical um, animal rights and animal protection group where they would go, um, you know, free animals from lab cages and all that sort of stuff. So they were very radical in, in, in uh, when they first started. But now they've, uh, since I would say like for the last 20, 25 years or so, they've changed their approach to be more um, policy and research oriented, and they've also changed their approach in terms of providing funds to research uh, that <coughs> is hopeful or, or perspective in eliminating animal testing. So they've, they've changed their approach uh, uh, over time very drastically uh, uh, from their history. Um, and so right now they uh, they do they put on um, uh, every year a kind of innovative um, contest where uh, researchers will provide uh, innovative new kinds of experiments or technologies that can be used as a replacement uh, for animal models or as another sort of example of reducing animal models or refining animal models in certain ways. So uh, that's kind of uh, been the experience. Uh, I've had with them and sort of talking with them about their history and those folks are very they're very nice folks and they they try and help with uh, developing policy uh, in the Netherlands uh, to surrounding uh, animal research um, so they they've I don't want to I don't want to necessarily say sort of soften their stance so to speak because they still uh, believe in the uh, uh, total replacement of animal models as a goal um, to which I, I also sort of, I, I deeply sympathize as well with that uh, aim. Um, but now they are trying to do it in a sort of um, less uh, violent and radical way and more of a way of showing people, um, genuinely speaking and scientifically speaking, there is a genuine alternative to this, um, as well as uh, you know, trying to help develop some moral arguments uh, and positions um, uh, <coughs> to help further advance that along. They, they, help, they, they help with like uh, looking at innovative transition studies and some sociological work, like what are the barriers that actually prevent researchers from shifting to uh, animal-free alternatives, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of the, uh, the stuff that I sort of focused on there. Uh, my research, or some of the stuff I was learning there was looking at things like uh, behavioral science and innovative transition studies and uh, things like that. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Can you imagine? So the problem is not that epistemic values uh, can impact, you know, have an, have an impact on research, right? Because we know it can be, it can be the case. But what you point to is that it can fuel the hype. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have a lot of hype uh, currently on these in vitro models. And Oh, all this is impacted as well by this uh, looking forward alternatives. Yeah. Again, we try to reach other alternatives. And so, again, yeah. so you have this very important move uh, uh, in the, because in December there's an FDA Modernization Act has just been passed. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's the first time in almost a century uh, since FDA does exist, exist that animal models are not required anymore for. Um, for drug testing because well, for, for biomedical experimentation and the argument but for one is because we have all these in vitro alternatives and it's not organized but it's mostly organic chips um, not organized parts of the picture or computer simulation as well and when it goes into regulation while we still know that these models are very like, equitative that we have a lot to do to confirm, to validate before we can use this model, uh, even for preclinical use. And so 
as a move from so the FDA is just to, to get rid of animal experimentation right away, but it opens a huge door. Uh, and this door has been open maybe because of this uh, kind of push, right? Because it's politics, it has to pass parliament and uh, senate and so on. <coughs> and so that's where we have uh, issues about uh, hive clients. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also interesting with with all this sort of stuff, generally speaking, because there there is this in studying this, there's been this kind of nagging question of is there really such a thing as organoid ethics, um, or is or is do organoids really just situate themselves in other ethical domains, um, and I'm. I'm kind of of the opinion that it's a bit more of the latter. But in a way, I kind of look at it almost as sort of like um, the ethics of multi-tools. Um, because multi-tools can be used in a variety of different contexts, and you can think of multi-tools as uh, you know being used in carpentry or being used in um, fishing or being used in, you know, whatever, um, in all these different contexts. But if you're focusing just on the multi-tool itself, then you can kind of see, you know, the, the ethical domains in a slightly different angle, in a slightly different light, and see how much more interconnected they all really are, in a way. So I think if we're, if, <coughs> if we're thinking about organoid ethics, in a way we're sort of thinking about the interrelation between all of these different ethical domains and the focal point of it all is the are these organ points, right? Because I, I kind of say, at least with with this PhD, that I have studied pretty much anything and everything. <laughs> I've had to learn about uh, all, all these different fields. Um, uh, and the only things I've yet to have to dive into in some way, shape, or form has been astrophysics and quantum <laughs> mechanics, <laughs> and and I, and I actually said that to um, uh, 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 somebody at a conference uh, a little while ago, and they said, "Wait a minute, oh, what astrophysics? Wait, you know that they've grown brain organoids on the International Space Station, right?" <laughs> I'm like what? Yeah, they sent organoids into space. I'm like, what for? They, uh, they, they're studying the effects of microgravity on uh, on the brain. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, now I have to figure out what microgravity is, and then I have to go into astrophysics for this. No, and now I'm waiting for someone to hook up a computer to uh, something like a brain organoid and do quantum computing with it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for all that to happen now. So. Yeah, it's it. This this stuff has become so much more complex uh, than what I thought it would be going into it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's much more complex than it, than it seems on the surface. Just a little ball of tissue. So strange, but so cool. <laughs> yeah. So one question would be: So since you did this review, some of you have filled, and you have this list of things. Are there anything new that? in the literature uh, recently, since you, because it's, uh, it's a, you did this scoping review like two years, a year or something ago. Yeah, this so was a, yeah, the systematic yeah. review um, happened, well, it was published um, uh, back in 2022, but the, the collection happened in uh, 2020, uh, yeah, it happened in 2020. So in the last couple of years, um, there have been some advancements. Um, Mostly, uh, some advancements have really occurred um, in relation to um, thinking about similarly related entities. So uh, I, I think of, uh, for instance, um, uh, there's some stuff about uh, out there a little bit about um, uh, what I call organoids cum silico, which are things like the on a chip systems I mentioned, um, and also. Uh, things like um, uh, something called dish brain, um, where researchers uh, integrated um, 
uh, neural tissue and like basically a neural organoid uh, onto an electrode array, um, which was able to translate the electro signals from the, that neural tissue uh, and also give uh, it some kind of sensory input. Um, and using artificial intelligence, it taught the neural tissue how to play Pong. And so you'll see, you see, uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll yeah, see, see that's far <laughs> so you'll see um, uh, on the video of, uh, 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 in the supplemental video of this experiment, uh, the paddle uh, moving up and down, and that paddle is controlled by that neural tissue. And it's looking for where the, the palm will, will go, and it's moving it accordingly, and the palm will bounce off the paddle. And, it, and based, on, based on the movement with, with artificial intelligence, it gave sensory input to that neural tissue, and that neural tissue was giving uh, that behavioral output of the paddle. Uh, <laughs> so dish brain uh, is, in a way, that scientific advancement um, that isn't, that's sort of, I think, now demanding ethicists, like kind of putting the cards on the table for the ethicists saying, oh, hey, you all were concerned about like, you know, creating, a, a, you know, about a, you know, brain organoids having sensory inputs and behavioral outputs. Well, now here's an instance of that. Um, yeah. And so I think uh, we're going to see, and it's actually some future research of mine, I'm hoping, uh, will be on uh, on, uh, on things like that, like what hap what are, what is really what are these sorts of things now that you can do things like give uh, some neural tissue like uh, sensory inputs and um, they can have behavioral outputs. Um, so there's some uh, philosophical questions uh, uh, there. A lot of the stuff now, uh, the, the a lot of the advancements. Um, and more discussions that have come out. Again, it's been really centered around brain organoids, mostly. And some stuff has also come out looking at different kinds of uh, perspectives about organoids. So there have been some studies uh, with patients of, say, who have cystic fibrosis, um, and asking, what do they think about using organoids for their treatments? Um, and and those patients with CF seem to be okay with it. Um, so that, there's, there's some evidence there that patients seem to be okay about this sort of thing, even though they don't have a lot of working knowledge about what organoids are. They're kind of fine with it as long as they um, trust that the, uh, the doctor and the researchers are going to use their tissue and their DNA and their data uh, responsibly, right? Uh, so that is also a kind of advancement I think we're seeing more of is trying to understand other people's perspectives uh, about this sort of thing. You did not answer my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for my because I ask you for because you have this structure of themes of topics for yeah. reasons. And then I think, are there any new topics or themes? Oh, new topics and then, and then you answer, and then you also ask, no, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of characteristic of this. Yeah. And then you say, okay, you have this new, we have this new technology, and we have this new technology that pushes the boundaries further. But then in terms of, in terms of topics or something, is that something that in terms is totally of absent from your list? And that when you look at it after you, because it's, you spend like your PhD on that, and I'll you go to the fans, and you say, oh, we have not seen this topic, or just everything fits in. Well, so, I'll say in terms of themes, um, pretty much all the literature that's come out now fits within the themes, some in some form or another. Um, and the same is kind of true, I think, with most other, uh, yeah, with all like the literature in terms of, say, the uh, most of the topics. There's some topics I think that have popped up, uh, and some of it has been like uh, uh, more discussions about, say, like. Uh, uh, like Frankenstein, like the association of like Frankenstein is also something that's uh, kind of new, uh, that that uh, has sort of escaped uh, this uh, this literature. Uh, also, the use of something called the six principles of animal ethics, um, as opposed to the use of the classic three R's framework of reduce, refine, replace, 
um, a new animal ethics framework uh, by De Graz uh, David DeGrazia and Tom Beecham um, uh, came out in 2019 and 2020. Uh, they named it the six principles, which divides these six principles uh, into uh, sort of two core values. Um, so, and they're trying to sort of build upon the three R's and fill in the gaps of the three R's that, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. So, and that has been applied uh, to say something like brain organoids, for instance. So something like the use of uh, a new framework uh, has, has popped up. Uh, the same thing with something like say, uh, the use of uh, responsible research and innovation frameworks. Um, that was also something new. This could be in research ethics. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Responsible research and innovation frameworks are also something that's new um, within uh, the organoid ethics space that wasn't really captured here. <coughs> uh, there's some other perhaps. Do you have uh, dualios somewhere? Huh? Do you have dualios somewhere? Have uh, dualios? No, I don't, I don't think so. No. Um, no, but there, there are perhaps, I think, I imagine there are other topics that have popped up uh, nowadays. More of it has been about expanding upon, more of the new stuff that has come out um, is more about expanding and deepening further discussions about these different kinds of topics. Uh, because, as I mentioned before, a lot of these different topics are very much under um, and require uh, a lot more in-depth uh, discussion. So most of the new stuff isn't really about trying to give something completely new here. Most of the new stuff is really more about, all right, well, we have all these different questions now. We should really go more in-depth about all of this. So. Yeah. Um, there was something that I didn't really understand uh, in, in the discussion. You said something about descript something about descriptive ethics, saying that uh, uh, most of this is descriptive ethics. Do you mean that what you are doing is descriptive ethics, or these papers you refer to are descriptive ethics? And in which sense, if that latter is the case, um, are they descriptive? What makes them descriptive rather than normative? normative? Yeah. So uh, a lot of what I'm doing. Um, is really kind of a bit more um, descriptive ethics. Yes, that I see. Yeah. Um, although some of what I do is also normative, uh, because in my work I've advocated for um, something I call like the moral principle of complexity. Where you know, the more complex the entity uh, is, the more researchers ought to undergo certain um, uh, uh, processes like reflection, anticipation, and deliberation. Uh, a lot of this is also, like, say, uh, descriptive uh, work insofar as ethicists will sort of uh, describe various problems um, and come to certain conclusions, but they might give some recommendations uh, at the end about, hey, you know, we see a kind of uh, problem <coughs> arising here, um, but then, like, they'll give some recommendations uh, at the end of the paper about, uh, well, we recommend that you know uh, uh, ethicists think about this in this way, and we recommend they think about it in this other way, and we recommend you know considering uh, this aspect. So a lot of the papers, in a way, are mostly a lot of them are, like the paper will be mostly descriptive, and then at the end there's like a little normative piece of it. How is describing a problem descriptive? Well, it, it's like you, you describe it as a problem. That's <laughs> that's a really normative claim, right? I mean. Well, that makes up for all, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, it's describing uh, it is describing the problem, um, but it's not providing any kind of say like uh, advocating for a particular kind of solution. Okay. So it's kind of like uh, like say I'll give like the, the within the commercialization and consent um, uh, theme um, with. Uh, Boers and uh, Bredenorts uh, are, are the two uh, ethicists who are um, uh, in, primarily in this space. What they do is they will uh, say things like, there have been certain arguments about um, these kind of uh, strange um, fitting 
uh, entities um, that uh, uh, others have argued to say that um, there is that these entities uh, require um, uh, uh, objective status, or they require subjective status, or they require uh, a kind of hybrid status. Um, so they'll go through like some of the arguments um, <coughs> that they will respond that they're going to be responding to. So the first that first bit where they're describing the, the position of something that they might be responding to is descriptive, and then their arguments sort of rebutting against it would be is what I'm sort of char characterizing as the normative position where they're sort of saying, okay, so now that we've described this position within orbital ethics, we're going to say why this is wrong. And they also, so uh, and they also will sort of say, uh, they'll, they'll build a lot of their argumentation on like say like, arguing why consent for governance is the best structure for organoid biobanking, right? But they'll also say, um, here is sort of what's happening in, uh, in some of the consent uh, spaces within biobanks previously. And they'll say like, these are valid concerns, but here's why our, uh, and, and these concerns also apply to organoids and organoid biobanks, but here's why our position is best. Right? So that's kind of the distinction I'm sort of making here, where if, if someone is sort of advocating for a particular position or advocating um, maybe against a particular position outright, um, I, will, I will label that as a kind of normative position and give it a kind of attitude coding. Whereas if they're not outrightly expressing a, uh, advocacy for a position or um, opposition to a position, I will um, sort of, on the safe side, um, label that as descriptive because I don't want to put words in the ethicist's mouth and saying like, you are advocating for this position where I'm saying no, but when they might say no, 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 I'm just describing the problem itself, right? So that's kind of that distinction that I, that I would draw there. And a lot of this is describing these different positions that are possible, right? So there's so, uh, so there's say a lot of ethicists will say this is a possible position that people could take, and this is a possible position that people could take, um, but they're not outright advocating for one or the other, right? So in like, I, I'll give an example again of like mine where um, I'm talking about the value conflict between uh, brain organ research for autism and neurodiversity, and I'll describe in a way, what the values are within the, um, uh, within the organoid research. And then I'll also describe the positions of uh, the neurodiversity perspective. But I will not outright claim that I am arguing in favor of the neurodivergent and neurodiverse perspective. All I'm saying is that there's this perspective, and here are the obvious values that you, you see in the research. They do, not com they do not converge. They are conflicting with each other. That is a problem. And then I'll give some, <coughs> then I would give some normative conclusions at the end and say, Here, here's a, this is the problem, but here's some quick possible areas where we can think about and further explore in terms of normativity where like say, um, uh, bringing neurodiverse people into the science as co-creators rather than as subjects of study. Um, allowing physicians to be open and honest about uh, the negative aspects of, of autism, um, but have them do so in a respective way. Um, rethinking about the ideas of what disability is, what what people, what uh, what it means to be a person, what illness is, um, what disease is, right? <clears throat> Those would be my normative positions, but I'm not really outright. Uh, arguing in favor, like say that neurodiversity perspective or the medical model perspective. Um, so that's, a, again, like kind of what I mean with this sort of, a lot of this is sort of descriptive. Um, and there, it doesn't mean that like, uh, most of this is descriptive, I would argue is like 60% maybe is descriptive and 40% is more normative, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was, I was more thinking like a more sociological view on ethics or something like that. I think descriptive ethics is usually something like that. Like studying people's views. 
without any uh, suggestions or, or even evaluation of these views. Right. Um, but that's not what you're thinking of. Okay. No, no. Okay. Do we have more questions or it's only for drugs? Okay. Close. Don't continue. Uh, with beer. Yes. 